This is weird. Let's go. <laughs> Hello, YouTube community, and welcome back to the channel. I'm here with my head of department, my lovely head of department, Aww. Mr. <laughs> Pollard, um, and we're here to go through some of the A-level text with you, because uh, that's kind of an area that actually we don't see much of on the old YouTube. Yes. We're going to be looking at Frankenstein and Never Let Me Go. Um, so we're first going to start off talking about just summarising the text, what they're about, and then looking at uh, the setting of the two prose texts. Um, so let's start off with Frankenstein then. So okay. good old Shelley. Well, <laughs> yes, what to say? I mean, it's very difficult to give an overview of, of a novel that's so... There's so many things going on. There's so much to talk about. Or oh, one thing. By the way, Frankenstein is not the monster. I think so many people used to think that Frankenstein's the monster and not actually the um, yeah. Victor Frankenstein. So just, sorry. Put yes. that out And here. sometimes <laughs> the students say it and, and you, you pass it by and then you come back and you think, did they say it? Did they not say it? And then occasionally, of course, <laughs> on a tired day, imagine a teacher's tired occasionally, uh, on a tired day we might well also uh, make the same mistake and the students pick up us on it and we <laughs> may have but okay. no, no, what can I say? <laughs> um, so, um, Frankenstein then. Um, well, I think one of the things to, to be thinking about with, 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 with novels is, is what the novelist kind of purpose is. And it's, it's obviously, uh, it's a novel that's, uh, I guess you could call speculative fiction, you could call it science fiction, you could call it almost gothic fiction because gothic was very popular at the time that she was writing. She published it in uh, 1818 originally and then you know, revised it, changed a few uh, important things and, in, and I think we published in 1831. So obviously it's a, a, a sort of, a, uh, I guess, a 19th century novel, Victorian novel to some extent. And um, Shelley's very, very interesting background herself, I think her autobiographical context is, is, is worth considering. She, obviously, uh, the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft um, and uh, William Godwin. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft wrote Vindication of the Rights of Woman, so you know, uh, you know, a strongly, uh, strong advocate of uh, female equality. Um, so she has those sort of radical ideas. Her William Godwin was again a fairly radical uh, essayist and, and political writer. So you know she 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 had that very strong sort of I guess education from her parents, and and that comes through in the novel as well. She was married to very very young, married to uh, Percy B. Shelley, who was uh, one of the. Uh, collection of uh, romantic poets. And you might uh, remember him from GCSE. If you do AQA, you'll see his name come up a few times. And you know, th and therefore, by extension, we're friends with Coleridge, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and uh, John Keats. And the novel really arose. They had a, uh, they were in Switzerland. It was, um, and they were having a competition essentially. And um, you know, these the, 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 these brilliant, brilliant writers. Uh, Shelley was only sort of seventeen, eighteen at the time. And they were having this competition, who could write the scariest story? Really? Yeah. That's pretty cool. And that's where it came from. <laughs> so it was, it was a sort of a parlour game, really, a kind of competition. And, yeah, what arose out of it is this novel that, 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 that has really stood the test of time. Purpose, I think she's exploring theme, you know, themes of, of, of you know, uh, interest in romanticism. Because this uh, is a romantic period, really, of writing, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, exploring uh, obviously scientific advances. There were there were all kinds of scientific advances going on at the time. Um, there's a warning of overreaching. You know what 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 should humans do? What should they not do? Um, you know if humans are straying into the role of kind of God and creating and reanimating. That's really what Victor Frankenstein wanted to do was to create a new race. Um, and you know he is given a very strong warning of what happens when you overreach those boundaries. So, so what was happening at the time? So you, you know, we have this idea of science becoming more prevalent in society. Mm. And so I suppose it's the idea of it when people started questioning religion and science. Absolutely, yeah. Inventors um, like Galvini, who, sorry, Galvini, Galvani, Galvanism, uh, and he, Electri they were using right. electric to, to, to get parts, bodies to move. And, um, you know, he famously- Is it on a uh, frog? It was a frog's leg, yeah, okay. doing that, with a bit of electricity going <laughs> okay. through it. Okay, sorry, I'm glad I didn't hit it's you It's all right, it's all right. <laughs> um, so, so there's all of those sort of things going on, really. Um, I mean, but I suppose at heart, it's a novel about um, parents and, and, and children. You know, Victor Frankenstein has created this child, and he abandons him. 
and and it's it's a, I suppose it's a warning of of what happens there. You know, if you were to do that, I mean, Mary Shelley had, had lost a child uh, relatively recently, um, and so you know she knew. I guess that was probably mm. maybe somewhere in her mind when she was writing the novel. It's interesting. Okay, and Never Let Me Go, what's the summary of about Never Let Me well, Go? Well, Never Let Me Go is also uh, science and society. Um, it's, it was written in 2005. Uh, Ishiguro has gone on since to be, uh, I think he won um, is it Nobel Prize for Literature, I think. Um, had written a, a novel previously, Remains of the Day, a very, very famous novel made into a film, great film. Um, anyway, the, so this novel, uh, written in 2005, a kind of dystopian novel. Now, dystopias tend to be set in the future, um, but actually, weirdly, I guess you'd say it's an atypical dystopia in as much as it's um, written in 2005, I think, just let me double check, I think he said it's set in the late 1990s, uh, yes, England, late 1990s, um, and, and Kathy H is uh, a clone, essentially, um, and she is recalling, she's around about 31 years old, so she's recalling her time growing up, a lot, of it, a lot of this is written retrospectively, she's recalling her time growing up when their clones were brought up in, in a boarding school called Hailsham in England, and so therefore I guess the setting is 1970s. Now, uh, what, what, what Ishiguro has said that he's, he's doing in the novel, he says actually, you know, a lot of people read it as being all about science fiction, about the you know, cloning the human genome project that was going on at the time, fears about genetic modification, you know, all of these issues about, you know, I guess, again, humans playing God and, you know, over, overstepping the mark, you know, kind of moral and ethical issues around um, cloning. Um, but he's actually said in, in, in interviews, yeah, I, I kind of get, that is what I was doing to a certain extent, but... You know, he, he says there's two other ways you could read a novel. One is as an alternate history. What happens if an alternate history is a novel that uh, takes a particular key moment in history and says, well, what if we went down that route rather than that route? Right. What would be the consequences of that? And he says, well, World War II, at post-World War II, they started doing um, this much, so obviously much earlier. What would happen if instead of you know, uh, doing most of these things in labs in, and growing organs, you know, in, in test tubes and in, you know, labs. What happens if we created entire clones, human beings, and then we harvest the organ, harvested the organs from them that way? Nice. And of course, this is a novel about these, these clones that are brought up to really just provide, um, almost farmed, if you like, in order to be harvested for their organs and obviously you know, they might donate one, they might donate two without dying. Third one, they're lucky if they continue and by the fourth of course you know, they're not able to, to function or survive. He says actually this is a novel maybe about mortality. These clones are never going to live beyond middle age. Their probably maximum age is going to be 30, 35. So you're halving if you like the lifespan. Yeah. What happens then? How do we as human beings continue to have hope, how do we continue to be positive in the view that we're all mortal, that one day we're going to die? So now we've gone through the summary of both Frankenstein and Never Let Me Go, we're going to actually talk about the setting of the two uh, prose texts. So uh, let's start off with Frankenstein then. Yeah, I mean, I suppose um, there's an overview for both of the texts. They are both uh, kind of contemporary, so they're, they're, they're written and set round about kind of a time that they were written. Um, with Frankenstein, um, most certainly 1818, 1831, you know, she's writing about um, the things that were going on at the time, for sure, you know, the, the interest in science reanimation that we've spoken about. Uh, but also, I mean, she draws upon, um, you know, quite a lot of historical events, literary allusions, a lot of things that were going on kind of around that time. So it's, she, she refers to things like Paradise Lost and, is it Prometheus and things like that? Absolutely, okay. yes. Um, I mean, th 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 there, are, there are a number of things. I mean, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, you know, Galva uh, Galvani, we've mentioned. Um, the guy uh, with the frog. That's right. The guy with the frog. <laughs> well, frog's legs. Frog's legs. <laughs> And in fact, actually, that segues quite nicely onto another thing that she draws upon, of course, is the French Revolution. Okay. Um, obviously, that's 1789 to 1799, and um, 
some critics have suggested that actually the, the monster, you know, who is kind of outcast from society, you know, is, is treated uh, abysmally by the, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of, well, everyone really that, that he encounters, you know, gets so angry um, that he actually, you know, he could be being sim seen as being symbolic of, you know, the working class who were, you know, constantly okay. sort of marginalised from society, mm -hmm. increasingly marginalised from society, and then obviously they uprose, didn't they, and they stormed the Bastille, and obviously the uh, Louis XVI deposed, and, um, and, you know, setting up of a republic. And, you know, you've got, I guess, that kind of um, revolutionary theme kind of runs through the novel really you know what 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 Victor's trying to do is quite revolutionary and obviously you know that it's there in romanticism you know that the romanticism is a you know a new way of looking at the world in contrast to the sort of enlightenment yeah um you know which which was you know kind of popular I suppose that the monster feels the same way the working class would feel like abandoned and kind of isolated from society and absolutely Okay. You know, he says, inflamed by pain, I vowed eternal hatred and vengeance on all mankind. Okay. And, you know, just, <laughs> uh, one way of looking at it. And obviously, um, gender's important. We mentioned about the fact that Mary Wollstonecraft uh, was Mary Shelley's mother, mm -hmm. uh, who'd written um, Vindication of the Rights of Woman. I think gender's there as well. Um, in particular, you know, the, the attitudes of the characters, such as um, Victor, t t towards female characters, you know, there's a quotation, um, and looked upon Elizabeth as mine, mine to protect, love and cherish. All praises bestowed on her, I received as made to a possession of my own. And obviously that, that idea of, of, of her being a possession, you know, um, you know this rather sort of uh, patriarchal attitude, you know, women as, mm. as kind of uh, possessions, you know, that, that, that was part of, you know, I think something that she was criticizing. I mean, there's a character called Justine, um, in a novel who is, you know, uh, sentenced to death and, you know, she has no voice, mm. you know, at all, really. Um, and and there's a criti critique of the judicial system and all the rest of it, but you know, I think female characters and the way they're treated in the novel, she's, she's definitely exploring, mm -hmm. you know, um, I guess in vertical commas, sort of feminist ideas. Yeah. Mm. Obviously, the, the, the contemporary literary illusions as well, so you know, there's a Coleridge allusion to uh, Rhyme the Ancient Mariner, to the land of mist and snow, but I shall kill no albatross. Um, and then uh, Goethe's uh, Sorrows of Young Werther, you have, I learned about Werther's imagination's despondence, uh, sorry, imagination's despondency and gloom. And I think what she's trying to do there is she's queuing to what uh, a lot of her readers would have known about and read in, in and around that time, and you know, for example, uh, the rhyme of the ancient mariner ends with the the wedding guest, you know, describing himself as a sadder and a wiser man, and you know, that almost kind of foreshadows what happens to Robert Walton at the end of a novel, where you know, after learning of Victor Frankenstein's um, tale, you know, he he has that choice whether he carries on on his mission to to the Arctic or or not. Um, so I think uh, you know. She's using those, if you like, to um, add extra meaning to the novel. Okay. You, you, in terms of historical settings for Never Let Me Go, I mean, if we were to move on to Never Let Me Go, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, reflecting the society in which he's writing, you know, he talks about the, you know, the, I think there, there are references to the Human Genome Project and stem cell research as a quotation from the novel. I saw a new world coming rapidly, more scientific, efficient, yes, more cures for the old sicknesses. Very good, but a harsh, cruel world. It's this idea that maybe um, the clones are just for a function, really, that, that, that um, the harvesting of their organs, you know, uh, is a pretty cruel world. But you know, in this world that he's created, you, you know, cancer's basically been, you know, eradicated. You know, uh, many, many really awful diseases have been eradicated because of these... Um, because of the stem cell research, because of the clones' existence, you know, the idea that actually they're sacrificed for man's advantage, and obviously there are some connections that one might make there with Frankenstein okay. as well. One of the things that, that there was an interest in the 90s and 2000s was um, 
the idea of almost kind of engineering babies, you know, mm -hmm. that if you, you know, you, you put certain DNAs together, you, you could eradicate certain diseases, you could mm -hmm. choose, for example, yeah, you maybe if you had uh, sex with a child, maybe their, their eye colour and, and things like that. And obviously, you know, that, that again links with Frankenstein, doesn't it? The idea of them, you know, mankind kind of playing yeah. God and overreaching, that's similar to, yeah. to what Victor does. There's a character who's mentioned called James Morningdale, who um, basically goes too far with this. Um, and, you know, then there's a backlash against clones and cloning and, you know, and, and the existence of schools like Hailsham where they try to educate them to be almost kind of human um, and they just want them almost back as battery farms. They're not interested in, you know, seeing where the organs come from. They just want the organs right. themselves. Um, in terms of historical setting, and they're massively contemporary. I mean, you've got the mention of Woolworths, which existed at the time, you know. <laughs> Good old Woolworths. <laughs> Woolworths. Everyone know what Woolworths yeah, is. Everyone know what Woolworths is, of course they don't. Yeah, you'll need to Google it. Yeah. Get on Google and Google <laughs> Woolworths. Oh, yeah. Woolworths, love yeah. it. The old pick and mix. Yeah. Oh my God, I was going to say the same thing. The pick and pick mix. Pick and mix. Oh, yeah, do you remember? Did, did, Smith isn't the same. No, no. no. <laughs> Anyway, a bit of a moment of reverie yeah. there. There we go. Good old Woolworths. Um, there's pop group posters, second-hand bookshops and all the rest. It's just recognisably England of, of the 1990s. And I think both novelists are going to quite great lengths to make sure that they're rooted in the now, in the history. Okay. Um, they go on, of course, to use geographical stuff as well, ge geographical references. Um, so do we think that some of the things that um, Shelley was talking about are apparent in our society today, would you say? In, in, I suppose in some ways, um, you know, a, a concern for those who don't have a voice, mm -hmm. you know, those who are you know, disenfranchised in some way. You know, I think, um, you know, the, the anger of, of, of the monster, you know, from being disenfranchised, from being you know, treated as an outsider. And it's the same with the clones of, as well. They're outsiders, yeah. you know, they're outside looking in. And I suppose that is more relevant today in the sense of there's so many people or groups that are feeling like outsiders um, because of religion or how they appear. And I think that's kind of quite similar to how the monster feels, really, isn't it? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And that causes him to do things that, you know... Yeah, well, he seeks revenge. And, exactly. and, and, and you know, and the feelings of you know, what, what it is to be so, so angry that you, you wish to seek revenge, obviously. Mm. You know, that you, you see all of these sort of things happening in today's society. With the clones, uh, you know, they're outsiders as well. You know, they, you feel desperately sorry for them because, you know, they're, they're kind of conditioned to kind of accept their lot, as it were. Mm -hmm. You know, which uh, is some ways how people can feel today, even in schools. Mm -hmm. You know, I suppose certain students may feel that they have been. You go, you, so you pick your options, and then you mm -hmm. go, and so you, you kind of feel like your life is kind of planned out for Absolutely. you in that sense. So yeah. Yeah, and and destiny is, is important in both mm -hmm. the novels as well. You know, the, the idea that you know it's kind of laid out for them, um, and they have re little if any choice over, you know, the way things are going yeah. to go. I mean, there, there are instances in Never Let Me Go, and they stood outside a um, like a modern office, and and it's a sort of glass fronted office that goes right down to sort of pavement level and you can see them and they, and, and, and they are describe how they are, the, their noses are pressed up to the glass and they're looking in and watching these people working in this office do it, living normal, inverted commas, normal life yeah. and, and just that sense in which they are separated from it, they can see it but they're never yeah. going to be able to be a part of that as well and it's, that, like it's one scene, of those, it? exactly, it's one of those moments, several moments that are kind of really heartbreaking mm. in the novel, you know, you really feel for them and that, you know, they want to be as human, they want to be human, they're learning, kind of conditioned at Hailsham how to be human, mm. but they're never going to be human. Yeah. Same like with the monster. Exactly, they're just outsiders, ostracised mm. from society, yeah. One of the things we might look at is, is kind of setting, kind of, uh, the symbolic settings. Okay. Um, the, the, there are quite, quite a few. Um, I mean, both... Shelley and, and uh, Ishiguro are using their, their settings in, in a symbolic way, i.e. to represent something or, um, you know, that, that's not literally there. Uh, so, for example, in Frankenstein, um, you know, there's mentions of the Arctic, 
you know, the mention of surrounded by ice which closed the ship on all sides, lost among the distant inequalities of ice, is, is, is in part a reference to Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, but it's also, you know, a theme of isolation, yeah. um, you know, which is very important in the novel, and of course is a, a really important for a Gothic novel, you know, the idea that you know, these events often happen a long way from uh, you know, sort of society. The power of nature was something that was very important to them as well. Because yeah. even when reading Shelley's poems, like Osman Diaz and mm -hmm. poems like that, mm -hmm. it's always coming back to man's power not always being as powerful as nature. Absolutely. Um, it's there in the prelude. There's an extract from the prelude, isn't there, in the, in, in one of the anthologies, mm -hmm. one of the poetry anthologies mm -hmm. at GCSE. You know, and he it, it, Wordsworth goes out. You know, yeah, on his boat, boat yeah. you know, and, and thinks he's all powerful. He's and, all yeah, powerful, and yeah. then you know he's he he's under um, one of the beautiful um, uh, mountains in in the Lake District, and he realizes, well, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Am, I am insignificant, and I think that's it. One of the, one of the ideas that's in the novel is, I think, is, is you know, maybe pantheism, the idea that you can see in nature God's creation. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Um, I, I, I think that's important, you know, that's why there's so many references to nature there because, you know, we're supposed to look at nature and just appreciate it for what it is. Mm -hmm. I think it's sometimes referred to as the sublime, you know, just being in awe of nature and realising that, you know, uh, a God that could create that, you know, we have to be absolutely respectful of and, 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 and impressed by. And I suppose Victor Frankenstein isn't, and that's why I suppose he has these consequences of trying to mess with the natural order in that sense of things. Yeah, absolutely. The, and, and, and when it gets to his worst stages, he, he, he goes back to nature, you know, he allows himself to be kind of uh, led by the wind on, mm -hmm. on his boat on Lake Geneva and, and so on and so forth, you know, the idea that actually in the scheme of things he doesn't have control over yeah. his destiny, yeah. that that is God that controls yeah. that. I suppose you're saying with the symbol of the Arctic as well, that's again nature controlling them because they're, they're absolutely yeah. surrounded by ice. Exactly. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's folly to think that you know we're, we're going to be able to go off and do this, that, mm. and the other. But actually, damn, God's in control yeah. of it. That's yeah. the kind of idea behind it, anyway. Okay. okay. Um, so, so the, yeah, lots of symbolic settings. Lots of symbolic settings in um, uh, Frankenstein are kind of gothic ones to make it seem more and more like a gothic. You know, kind of science fiction uh, novel. Um, Never let me go. I think. I mean, I, I. I think it's really clever what 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 Ishiguro does with some of these. Yeah, you know, the references to edges. You know, we were once again at a cliff edge. It's this idea that there are, that there always seem to be kind of almost on the edge, on the edge of something. Maybe falling off the edge of sanity because they realise they lose it because they realise that you know that they're not going to live very long. Okay. Um, or you know that sort of liminal space, that that sort of um, edge of life and death. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's the, they go and visit an old boat later on, and and the boat is is kind of beached boat, and you know some people have said, well, that's symbolic of you know um, the River Styx, which was the mythological river that uh, flowed between um, uh, you know, souls when they when people died, their souls were carried across the okay. river by the by the boatman, the ferryman called Charon, and some have seen the boat as being symbolic of that. So again, more references to death. Right. Kingsfield, where Tommy is sent to do his sort of final donations, um, you know, is described as being out of the way and awkward to get to, and I think um, you know that's important because it's again the idea that the the public want these clones kind of out of their sight, really. Right. They don't want them around. That's, I suppose, with Frankenstein, in, sorry, the monster. Absolutely. In the they don't want him around either. Absolutely. And there are references to trees, you know, there's sycamore trees. Um, you know, we part beside a clump of sycamores. You know, sycamore is sometimes seen as being symbolic of clarity and clear sightedness. It's sometimes uh, seen as being symbolic of death. Um, and um, there's lots of references to narrow places. When I look back over the novel to to kind of put um, you know the, 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 this, a presentation together, there are loads and loads of references to narrow places, and that goes to the, goes back to the point we were making before that actually their lives are kind of laid out for them. They don't really have much leeway to move, right. to turn around, and to to go off on mm -hmm. a different course or a path that's kind of laid out for them. And that idea of predestination, mm -hmm. 
fake controlling again is another connection that you yeah, can make, make with, with, with Frankenstein. Uh, Frankenstein. Um, so now we're going to look at some of the connections between the setting of both Frankenstein and Never Let Me Go. So what do you, do you say is the, uh, the main kind of connections between them? Well as we said, I mean um, the, the, the settings are used to show that, that, that both the clones and the monster are, are outsiders. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, I referenced the, the office uh, that they were looking to looking into and never let me go, yeah. but also um, you know the the fact that um, the monster is required to uh, stay in a place, looking at the Delacy's cottage, but never, <coughs> well not never, but he does approach it, mm -hmm. but then of course that breaks the spell. So that idea that he's they're vicariously living their lives through other humans, right. you know, um, or through, through humans. Obviously, there's the grand. I would say a big dif a difference is that in Shelley's, uh, in, in Frankenstein, Shelley's using these sort of much grander settings, so Mont Blanc, Lake Geneva, and so on and mm -hmm. so forth, um, to perhaps convey her messages about romanticism, where and, and pantheism, uh, whereas the, I think they're on a smaller scale in in, in, in Never Let Me Go. Um, both of them interestingly use fog and mist but in slightly different ways, so the, using the weather to represent the, the kind of feelings of the characters. Right, and supposed to be being uh, obscure in the sense of their life and their direction in that uh, sense. Exactly. You know, sometimes we call it pathetic fallacy. Mm -hmm. you know, so for Shelley, you know, there's lots of gothic you know, ways, you know, the idea of the monster appearing out of the mist to give it a sense of mystery. Um, whereas in Never Let Me Go, when Kathy refers to mist, it means that she can't really remember things very well. Right. It's a retrospective narrative, but she's, it, it t tells us as a reader, oh, well, this next bit, I might not have remembered this quite right, though I'm right. going to pretend that I have. Okay. Um, I, I think, yes, we've mentioned, haven't we, that, that they're both kind of outsiders looking on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think nature is presented um, as, as, as kind of comforting and soothing in Frankenstein very often, you know, um, but I think something almost in, in Never Let Me Go, it's seen as being kind of a fearful adversary, almost terrifying. Um, in, in Frankenstein, doesn't the monster die by just basically walking out into the, the ice and then that's right. dying? Yeah. So it's kind of him returning to nature in that sense. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Never Let Me Go, sometimes nature is seen as being fearful. There's the woods behind the behind Hailsham where there are all of these horrible stories of what's happened to previous Hailsham students. Right. Going off there and you know, being, you know, murdered or, or whatever. Right. So um, both of them, as we said, use really sort of familiar and real settings, and both of them use kind of these uh, contemporary references and allusions to make them clearly recognisable as places right. for the contemporary audience. But then obviously, this with a twist, isn't it? Some odd things go on. Um, I think both of them use these kind of um, settings what we might call liminal settings, sort of on, on the edge of or on the cusp of two things. So for example, just looking at my notes, um, in Frankenstein, she's using the blurring of the boundaries between life and death. Mm -hmm. That's a clearly a gothic technique. Yeah. You know, um, Ishiguro uses sea sites, so the idea of the, 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 the liminal space between land, uh, land and sea. That's the edge you talk about as well. Yeah, maybe. the cliff edges. Yeah. There's also fences as well. At the very end of the novel, Kathy's um, at a barbed wire fence um, and she's looking out on this field and there's all this rubbish blowing against it but this idea that she's fenced off from right. um, society um, obviously to show that they're kind of outsiders that's Best probably thing. about it yeah okay. in oh. terms of just setting but obviously we'll maybe have a a chance to have a chat about some of the other things that uh, are covered in these two novels. Your brain is amazing, by the way. <laughs> so, um, that's the setting of Frankenstein Never Let Me Go. We'll be doing more videos looking at kind of the same like, characters and themes and maybe even trying to think about how you would go about answering a question like this. Absolutely, uh, the comparison yeah. question. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, you can all probably find uh, the podcast ver version of this also on um, the website, www.educatingminds.co.uk and uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me or Mr Pollard, probably Mr Pollard, um, you can leave it in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel. So you also have a channel now as well? I do, I do. What's and uh, we will put it at the International Teacher. 
is, is my Twitter, and uh, we'll put it beneath this so that you can you can oh, access it from there. See, look at your, you know. Hey, I'm getting done with you. <laughs> I've been taught by the best. <laughs> oh dear. So yes, so don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and also subscribe to Sir's channel as well. Um, until next time, we'll see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.